Hello everyone, this is Jay from This, That, and Everything, and you're listening to the BS Podcast Network. Come in, Univex. James Bond here. Over. He's been asking for you all morning. Where in the world are you, James? Well, I've just been reviewing an old case. Oh, so I'm an old case now, am I? Shh, it's the office. Uh, tell him I'm on my way, will you? He is not on his way. Sylvia, behave. We'll do this again some other time soon. Do what? Last time you said that, you went off to Jamaica. I haven't seen you for six months. I'll be there in an hour. I'll tell him. Hey, your old case sounds interesting, James. Uh, make that an hour and a half. <laughs> Now, about that lunch. <laughs> Who are you? I'm Batman. Who are you? My name is Bond. 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 Batman. His name's Bond. James Bond. I am Batman. Bond. James, James Bond. Bond. I'm Batman. Bond. Bond. I'm Batman. Bond. Bond. I'm Batman. This is the Batman vs. James Bond Show. The show covering everything related to Batman and James Bond movies. And now, here's your host, Brian Thomas. Hello everyone and welcome back to an all new episode of the Batman vs. James Bond Show. The name's Thomas, Brian Thomas, and I am your host. And this is the show where we discuss everything related to Batman and James Bond movies it is great to be back, and let me tell you why. Um, yeah, I, the sar- you can detect the sarcasm in my voice. No, there really isn't any, any sarcasm. I'm actually really excited to be here because, of course, I um, you know, get out of the, of the family chores, the husband and wife honeydew list and so forth, and it ends up being the the honeydew list. And any, any anybody who's in a relationship out there, married and so forth, their significant other, you know what I'm talking about, and... What's so great about this show, obviously it's all about Batman movies and James Bond movies. I mean, that says it all right there. But another good thing is it's about an hour escape from our lives, and we can talk about the two characters, the two bat- most badass characters out there. And I-, I look forward to it every single week, and hopefully you do as well. Um, in addition to that, I am, it, I am anxiously awaiting for my, um, my place of employment. Yes, I do actually work a nine to five job, but we'll just say that I'm waiting for my, my place of employment to just say, guess what? We're closed tomorrow. Why is that? Because there is snow on the way. So says the weather forecaster. So says the weather people out there saying that we, my area in the Washington DC area could get anywhere between six to 12 inches of snow. And honestly, I want to bundle up just like George Lazenby. I want to strap on the goggles. I want to put on that, you know, oversized, you know, a beanie kind of hat and i want to just go well i can't go skiing in my area but i just want to go out and play in the snow or i just want to have a nice snow day and watch nothing but batman and james bond movies because that's what i do so other than that though it's been a great week and i hope yours was as well um yeah before we jump into things just a reminder the batman versus bond.com that's right you know the name go there for all the latest shows and more content you can also find the batman versus james bond show on the BS Podcast Network, that's bspodcastnetwork.com. Find my show and a whole bunch of other great shows on there. And Batman vs. Bond t-shirts are available for gals and guys. They're just $20.49. Change back on $21. All you have to do is go to bspodcastnetwork.com, click on the shop tab, proceeds benefit the Wayne Foundation R&D department and the Q Branch Labs. Now let's get down to business. Um, Yeah, it has been a very newsworthy week. Like I always say, actually last couple weeks I think I've said this, is that the great thing about this show is that, you know, obviously it's about the two best, coolest fictional characters out there. Um, You know, in addition to that, what makes it so great is, you know, I go in thinking, okay, well, this might be one of those weeks where I have to plan ahead thinking it's not going to be such a um, news-filled kind of episode. And that's okay because I always have a backup plan. Like the Joker, it's all part of the plan, right? Um, 
you know, at the same time, the news breaks whenever it feels like breaking, right? So I'm going to c- change it up a little bit this week. I'm going to put the James Bond news ahead of the Batman news because in my mind, this is some really important things that are going on right now in the James Bond world. And I feel like I owe it to the Bond fans. I mean, you know, yeah, there's important Batman news out there. There always is. But James Bond fans, you know, we all get excited as soon as we hear a little tidbit. So, um, let's kick it off with this. So, Two names that I have talked about actually recently, Neil Purvis and Robert Wade. Yeah. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with those two names, they are the writers of James Bond since 1999. That is, since the world is not enough. Die another day. Excuse me. Um, Yeah, I meant to do that. Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, Skyfall, and Spectre. Now, the thing is about Spectre specifically is that they weren't the – they were brought in um, to help polish the script, as they like to say. So who actually wrote that script was John Logan. Now, he was the writer uh, – he did assist in Skyfall, and he was the writer of movies such as Gladiator. But they came in because they have that knowledge of James Bond clearly, and they kind of added some more to the script, whether it was – I'm not exactly sure, but we'll just say it could have been action. Who knows? But, you know, to kind of fine-tune it. And that's okay. And I think that, you know, I've went on record saying, you know, Spectre is – not as good as Skyfall. It's not the best Bond film out there, but I will say it is an enjoyable Bond film. And I really didn't, um, I think it's, you know, it will go back and listen to my rankings and you know where I place it, but I will say it's easily a 4.5 out of 5. I think it's not perfect. It's got its flaws, but I'm, it's still one I can turn on and enjoy from time to time. Um, so the big thing about this is that, you know, a couple weeks ago, or not even not even a month ago, Neil Purvis and Robert Wade were saying, you know, I don't think we we're going to be coming back because you know it's just uh, how can you write James Bo- a James Bond film right now with everything that's going on in the world in general, and you know just it's very complicated. We've you know they've juggled so many different they've juggled actually two different eras of James Bond. If you think about, it, they've juggled Pierce Brosnan's era. And then they ch- they ch- the challenge of writing after incidents such as 9/11, and just trying to put James Bond or make James Bond even more grounded. You deal with terrorist organizations, you deal with um you know cameras and you know drones watching you and so forth. So how can they deal with that kind of a challenge for whoever the next writer is going to be? Well, they spoke too soon because they actually have been hired to write bond 25 now here's the deal so there's a writer out there and he works for the daily scribe daily mail scribe that is and his name is baz babig boy i'm sorry if i imp- i pronounced that incorrectly but he went on on twitter a couple days ago and he said that you know and this guy is credited we'll give him credit is that he um, broke stories for skyfall and specter and they were all proven correct so he does have credibility um, this isn't just like something just made up. It, you know, it's been reported by James Bond live for those of you that follow that. The spy command, I think, even reported this also. Um, you know, they said that, you know, Purvis and Wade are going to be, or been hired to write Bond 25. Um, and they also said that Daniel Craig is still deciding on whether he will do it or not. Now, a little later on, he also wrote, however, when I was in Los Angeles, an executive at a studio close to the Bond franchise told me that while Barbara Broccoli is keen on Jack Hudson, she's also absolutely keen on having a black actor playing Bond. So, um, yeah, well, let's look at the first part of the story here. The fact that you have Purvis and Wade, which, like I said, they, they are, when, when they do a script right, I think they, they do knock it out of the park. Um, Casino Royale and Skyfall are clearly evident of that. Say what you want to say about the world's not enough. I can make an argument on there that actually maybe it was the direction that or the direction that Michael Apted took on that script. I have no idea, but I think that, you know, overall, I think the world's not enough is a is a good Bond movie. It's not the best. Obviously, it's not the worst, though. Die another day. I can see where everybody's going to go with that because it was just those two guys and you can we can blame them. We you know the script that they turned in. At the same time, though, it could be also I, – I still like to put blame on the director because at the end of the day, it's the director's film. It's like, okay, here's the ingredient. I'll compare it to cooking because I'm, I'm taking actually cooking classes, classes right now. I'm trying to pull a Roger Moore and a view to a kill. Um, bottom line is that – Purvis and Wade are more like, you know, writing the ingredients, but it's up to the, the the cook, that being the director, saying, hey, um, I don't like your recipe. I'm just going to turn it into whatever I want, and this is the Bond movie that I'm going to put out. So that's what it is. But when you, you, you see when you have directors like, say, um, 
Martin Campbell. Martin Campbell knows damn well how to direct a Bond movie. He's done movies such as GoldenEye, and he's done movies as Casino Royale, which could be one of the best Bond movies we've ever had. Um, Sam Mendes knew what was, you know, he obviously knew how to work with their script and with John Logan. So, and Skyfall, like I just said, it's, you know, they were brought in to polish the script. So, I can't blame them because that that was just the kind of story. I mean, we we could go. I don't want to go into spoilers about Spectre t- tonight. I really don't because there's not enough time. But I will say this is this gets me excited for multiple reasons because you have guys that you know have a really good background. They ha- they have a good idea of the Bond character. Um, they they have a, actually a really great uh, uh, understanding of the Bond character. This also gets me excited because the pieces are finally starting to move more with Bond 25. I mean, before, like, even at the end of last year, we had no idea what was going to be happening with Bond 25. It's like, is this even going to happen next year? Who, who in the hell knows, really? But now you have, when you hire people to do a script, at least it's like, okay, the machine is moving. The, the, the gears are starting to, you know, wind up a little bit or, or however the phrase goes. So that gets me excited. Now, I will say, you know, Daniel Craig returning, well, that's that's still kind of I'm kind of worried about that. But at the same time, this next story will kind of stir the pot even more. And I'll let you be the judge of this. Now, over the last week, Omega held an event. Um, This was at the Beekman Hotel. Not exactly sure where that is. Bottom line, though, is that a certain special guest attended and there was only 35 guests. We'll take a while. Guess who this was? This was Mr. Daniel Craig. Now, the cool thing about this is that, you know, this was all about watches. And one uh, thing I've always been a fan of with the James Bond movies is the watches, specifically the Amigas. Going all the way back to Goldeneye with 19, in 1995, the Pierce Brosnan, Omega Seamaster. Uh, if you have to, like, Google that real quick, to, or if you're a Bond fan, you know exactly what watch I'm talking about because that – I love, love, love that watch. And I've tried so many times to find replicas of that watch because at the time I couldn't afford it and so forth. And – um you know, it, it's just something about that Omega watch. Everything, even Casino Royale, when Daniel Danny Boy was, you know, wearing his, you know, Omega watch when he was on the train with Vesper, and she says, um, you know, expensive watches, uh, Rolex, Omega, beautiful. You know, things like that. I love that kind of deal. And they made even a bigger deal about it when it came to Spectre. And the cool thing about that is was that um Daniel Craig actually had a part in picking out that watch. And, you know, it's not like it, that's actually one of the first times that's actually really happened where he actually ha- kind of had a say and what he was looking for in the watch. And, um you know, that, like I said, I'm kind of geeking out over something so silly. But at the same time, though, these words were actually spoken from the CEO of Omega. And his name is Reynald Ashleman. You know, he was just, he ended up saying this, saying, you know, he, they raised their wine glasses to toast the special guests. And he quoted saying, you've been a wonderful ambassador. He told Craig, quoted, I'm not alone in saying that we are hoping it's you. Now, that can be taken so many ways. But, you know, I know that as a Bond fan, when I hear that, and it sounds like this guy, the CEO of Omega, is clearly a Bond fan also. And he loves his the relationship, the long relationship that he's had over 10 years now with Daniel Craig. And for Daniel Craig to be as involved and being in like this little, you know, I guess presentation, whatever you want to call it, this little party in in a sense, um, you know, that that gets me still thinking. I mean, if I had to pull out my Batman detective skills right now, I would say that, you know, Daniel Craig doesn't want to leave it yet. He hasn't said yes or no. Maybe he's, you know, he wants to see the script first. And that would make sense because, you know, you don't want to just sign up for you know, it depends on the actor, I suppose. I mean, maybe Sean Connery's done that. Maybe Roger Moore just saying, well, I mean, why not one more? You know, I don't care. They're going to pay me the money. So, you know, show me the money. Why not? But yes, I pulled a Jerry Maguire. I'm sorry. But the, besides the point, though, um, Daniel Craig has always been picky, it seems like, about the kind of movies that he's going to be doing. I mean, I would say, you know, out of the movies that um he's done, I can't say there's been many bad ones that I've ever seen him do. I mean, Maybe Cowboys and Aliens an argument can be made there, but, you know, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, you know, uh, movies like that. I mean, I think that, you know, he's, he is a, he really is an actor. He's not just, it doesn't seem like he's one that's just out for the pay- paycheck. So I'm really anxious, as always, to see what's going to be developing. Who knows? Maybe this time next week, I will be reporting saying, hey, guess what? Daniel Craig has signed on to be James Bond, but I highly doubt that 
you know, Purvis and Wade are going to be able to knock this script out right away. I think this is, you know, hopefully they can put some time and effort in this. Um, you know, who knows how long it takes to write a script. Anybody who's like an actual movie fan out there, you probably have a better idea than myself. I think that you know, from what I've read, everything that I know, it's not like an overnight process. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll, we have more to report soon. Um, one last thing I did want to mention, and, um, this happened in the last couple of days. It came out, and this is per James Bond Live and the Spy Command online saying that the Bell helicopter that was bought for Bond 25 is not actually going to be used for Bond 25. Now, what does that mean? Well, Pretty much it means, and I'll read this, um, this is actually from mi6-hq.com. Um, MI6 can confirm that the Bell UH-1D chopper was purchased for a to-be-announced historical war drama that Eon Productions is co-producing and not Bond 25. I repeat, not for Bond 25. So, um, yeah, kind of disappointed with that because I was like, okay, well, yes, they're good. They have ideas of what they want to do, but, if you look at the news story, like I just read, Purvis and Way don't even have a script. So it, why would you try to have? Why would you purchase a helicopter for an action scene or some kind of sequence when you don't even have a damn script? So obviously it makes sense. So um, yeah, stay tuned for more Bond Twenty Five news. Hopefully it'll be happening sooner than later. So now this is also a James Bond story in a sense. Now obviously we're not going to be getting an official Eon Productions James Bond MGM movie coming out this year. Might not even happen next year. Who knows? If I had to be a betting man. I'm still going to say, I still hold to what I said before, that Bond 25 will be happening before the Batman movie, even though the Batman has a director, but that's another, we'll talk about that later. Um, there is a James Bond movie sort of coming out. This one is called Becoming Bond. Now, when we think of James Bond actors, we usually immediately think of Sean Connery, Roger Moore, Pierce Brosnan, Daniel Craig. And even Timothy Dalton. And, well, the only reason I said Timothy Dalton like that is because um, I think he's very underrated. Absolutely. Um, I know, like, in this past week, I've had I've done a lot of posts about Bond movies and Batman movies. But Pierce, I'm sorry, Timothy definitely, you know, everybody said that, you know, he was underrated. And we all agreed that he was probably ahead of his time. And But even though he only did two Bond movies. But one name that always gets forgotten, and I think usually gets forgotten, is the name Lazenby. George Lazenby, that is. So uh, now many Bond fans, you know, know that, you know, the story about G George Lazenby is that he was in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. OK, um, yes, he did take the place of Sean Connery immediately after you only lived twice, um, an Australian actor. And, you know, he was pretty much famous for being one and done. He, you know, kind of, I think, as far as I know, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong online, but. Um, he kind of fudged his transcript when it came for movies and, you know, he was saying that he did all this and they hired him and he really didn't have any experience whatsoever. So, you know, the cool thing about this is now Hulu is going to be exclusively releasing a documentary narrative about the life of Bond actor George Lazenby. Um, the trailer was recently released and, you know, I gotta say it looks really, really good, really, really interesting because right now I I'm, just foaming at the mouth for any kind of James Bond stories right now or any kind of James Bond movie whatsoever. Um, I love the documentaries that come out for James Bond. There's multiple ones. There's like the, there's one I've, I, um, I don't think I've ever mentioned before. It's called Bond Girls Are Forever. And that came out around the same time as Die Another Day and talks about the, you know, Bond Girls, um, the 40th anniversary of Bond Girls at the time in 2002. And it's a really, really good, you know, background about James Bond Girls and, so forth about just saying you know what it means to be a bond girl some people find it a curse some people just they get so excited about it and so forth um or the actresses that is um there was one called everything or nothing that was another uh documentary about james bond it was more pr about the production side of james bond about them about the producers about um harry r saltzman and albert r broccoli and th about them trying to get the production of james bond you know into place with ian fleming and how hard it was to get dr no made and then after that everything how it kind of took off and that's definitely one i would check it, i would recommend also now this documentary is going to be slightly different because it's going to be actually include more it's more of a story it's like i said it's going to be a documentary narrative now this comes out in a premiere exclusively on hulu on may 20th that's right may 20th on hulu mark your calendars there so the film tells the unique story of george lazenby um an australian man who went from selling used cars to se starring as the iconic spy in honor majesty's secret service 
Taking over from Sean Connery, it would be his sole bought in film as he rejected a lucrative offer to remain in the part. Um, you know, another thing that they quoted in saying was uh, in the press release saying in the trailer, the actor promises drama, romance, comedy, sex, drugs, violence, twists and turns. And quoted, he said, this is actually from George Lazenby. How could I re- remember if it wasn't true? He teases. Um, the movie is written, directed by Josh Greenbaum. Um, Lazen- Lazenby, like I said, will be, you know, kind of reflecting back on it. So it's kind of cool to see it from his perspective because, um, you know, he, you know, if he remembers it, then, you know, it's got to be pretty much true. I mean, why would he lie about this, right? <clears throat> we'll see. But I, I know, I actually, I think I believe him. I think this is actually one, it, this is one interesting story I'd really like to see. Um, this, it's actually going to be, now the actor is going to be, Playing George Lazenby in this documentary is going to be Josh Lawson from House of Lies, Jeff Garland, Jake Johnson, Jane Seymour, former Bond girl from Live and Let Die, and Dana Carvey also star in the film. So, like I said, it's always interesting, you know, because, like I said, with George Lazenby, that's just, he. I feel like he's like the forgotten Bond. And I know that a lot of people would agree with me on that. And what's so funny about that is Honor Majesty's Secret Service might be a lot of people rank that as one of their favorite Bond movies or one of the best Bond movies ever. And But even when I did my ranking this year, I was thinking, I was like, okay, love, 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 Honor Majesty's Secret Service. What was the one thing that stood out there? George Lazenby. I think it was George Lazenby. And, you know, I think that it was the supporting cast and the story that, you know, made the movie so well. The John Barry score, um, the action and the fight sequences in there. And I think that you know, had it been another actor, and I'm not saying that Sean Connery could have played Honor Majesty's Secret Service. If you had an actor, let's just say that, let's fast forward to Honor Majesty's Secret Service being released to this day. If you had Daniel Craig playing that 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 James Bond in that movie, I think it would have been an even better movie. I, and that's saying a lot. I really think that is. But I think that, yes, the actor, you know, they tried to like kind of say, oh, um, you know, this never happened to the other fella. And I, I do like that. You know, that's kind of like giving the um, you just kind of a wink at the camera, if you will. I do like that. But I think that the weakest part is George Lazen be. But and, you know, yeah, I kind of have like sour feelings towards him because, you know, he just kind of he did kind of lie to get the part and you know and like i said maybe everything that i'm saying right now is not true and maybe when this comes out this will clear some things up for me but i just i i remember watching videos about it, like um you know documentary i think it was everything or nothing and i think even on youtube just saying you know i had no experience and i just was able to get my get into this role and they hired me and i'm like Wow, you must you must have, you know, done something right in there because to play the part of James Bond. I mean, how many actors have played really James Bond? I mean, that's there's it's not even like it's under 10 actors so far that have played James Bond. So that's quite a an accomplishment, I would say, but why would he turn it down? So I can't wait to see what this movie is going to be like, this documentary. Um like I said, it premieres on Hulu on May 20th, so stay tuned for that. So, let's move into some Batman news here. Yeah, all right, Batman fans. So, we at last, we'll call this Batwatch, okay? Batwatch 2017 for right now. I'm, I'm codenaming that right now until, you know, we, we have a na- name for the Batman movie. So, I'm calling it Batwatch. So, Batwatch 2017 as of now. Um, so far, we have Matt Reeves directing uh, the bat, this Batman solo film. Uh, it will be starring Ben Affleck. Um, ben, ben Affleck will still be... Um, well, I think he's I, – last I heard, you know, he's going to be producing. I don't think he's going to be writing the script because at last we heard it was going to be uh, Chris Terrio that was going to be writing the script. So um, that's what we know so far. But we don't – we haven't heard much since then about, you know, we there was something that broke at the end of last year by the actor Joe Manginello. And he was saying that, you know, he – went on record saying, you know, he's going to be playing the villain of Deathstroke, even on the Justice League film set. Ben Affleck is tweeting out a picture of Deathstroke in the Justice League or maybe even for the Batman movie. So it was originally set to be filming actually almost right about now, the spring, um, summer of 2017. But now what we know is that Joe Maginello, Maginello, I can never pronounce his name correctly. I'm sorry. But anyway, he was chatting with R.I. Magazine about the Batman movie, and he was saying that, you know, right now um, there is no problem if it takes time to get the movie right as no one wants to subpar flick. 
And he quoted saying, last year I said May, and that was my understanding. It depends. They have big plans for this movie. Whether or not we start exactly on this date or in June, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Here's the thing. The creative process needs to be respected, and no one involved in this film wants to make anything less than an unbelievable film, a legendary film. The movie will start shooting whenever those pieces are in place, and we know this is going to be something we're proud of. We're not going to be backed into a start date, scrambling to get something off the ground just to get it off the ground. Everyone involved wants to make the best film possible, so that's really what it's about. It's funny how the media likes to run with, oh, there's terrible, oh, their script needs to be revised, they're drama queens, there's a creative process, and everyone on the cast and crew wants to make the best movie possible. So that's what we're going to do. When we start shooting it, we'll start shooting it. It will be soon, I can say that. Here's the thing, no one wants to create the superheroes movie that's polarizing to fans and critics. Rest assured, we're going to do this thing right. So there you have it, um, direct from the actor who will be playing Deathstroke, um, Joe Manginianello. And he said that, you know, it, and let's look at this, what he was saying. There was, he had a lot of stuff to say, but overall he's saying, you know what? They're not going to get it right. He, it's almost echoing what Ben Affleck was saying, saying, you know, just, you know, I don't want, we're not going to do this movie. We're not going to just shoot this movie until we know it's right. Well, I, that's awesome. That's actually really awesome because it gives me relief saying, Hey, you know what? We're not going to just put some like little cookie cutter kind of movie together and we're not going to just release it just because we have to meet a deadline. No one wants that because this movie, this better be one of the best damn Batman movies ever because of everything this movie has gone through. Now, and I say that just as you've lost a director, the star was the director. But you still have the star, which is always good. You do have a director in Matt Reeves. That's good. So you have every, you have everything in place, as I always like to say. But, and you have, you know, it's all about the story, of course. So I think that's what's going on right now. If I had to guess, they're just trying to get this script right. They really are. And, you know, I don't think they want to start shooting, you know, until everything's in place. So we'll see what we see. So as of right now, as it stands, Joe Manganiello will still be playing Deathstroke versus Ben Affleck's Batman. I'm looking forward to it. Um, like I said, everything I know about Deathstroke comes purely or mainly from the Arrow TV series. Don't fault me at that because I, yes, I am a huge, huge Arrow fan and I love the character of Deathstroke in there. I think he's one of the best villains of season two. So. Um, there was a new image of the Batmobile from Justice League. We'll talk about that another time. Um, I'll make sure I tweet that out there for you. If you saw it, pretty much, we'll talk about it real quick. They put, they took the Batmobile and, you know, from Batman v Superman and Zack Snyder, I guess, you know, he outfit, he fitted it out with even more weapons. So this thing looks like even more of a tank than before. And what's so funny is because all the criticism that Batman v Superman got about Batman killing, and they were saying that, you know, Batman's kind of, you know, change, I guess, not like a change of heart, but, you know, he's kind of learning from, you know, everything, you know, he was wrong about with Superman. But it is also kind of funny. Well, you're putting a, a load of armor and you know, even more armory on this Batmobile. I mean, how much more, how many more weapons can you really put on there for Batman who's not supposed to kill? I don't know, because this could be an alien story. So I guess killing aliens is not such a bad thing, right? So we will see on that. Uh, Warner Brothers. Yeah. Here's one that I, de- this is definitely going to cause, uh, if I had to put a poll, I have tons of polls going on right now, but if I want to hear your opinion on this. So, Warner Brothers was actually released a quote on there. Um, they were interviewed and they were asked, you know, whether they would be open to releasing a rated R movie in the DC Films universe in the DCEU. And the Warner Brothers insider, um, a Warner Brothers insider told the rap 100% yes with the right characters. So let's look at some stu- statistics here. Okay. First of all, um, Batman v Superman, love it or hate it. It was a PG 13 film. Um, you know, the ultimate cut of it, the only edition that I ever suggest that you watch is a three hour, uh, it's a three hour movie. And, you know, did it have things that made it rated R? Honestly, I would say no. I would say it's a very borderline. I think the violence, um, is specifically in the desert scenes and so forth where the terrorists were and Superman was, uh, I'm not going to spoil too much. Don't worry. This really isn't spoil. And besides, the movie's about to hit a one year anniversary in a couple weeks. So there you go. Um, the, the desert scene where Superman was saving Lois Lane, um, 
Lex Luthor's um, henchmen were out there and they were shooting up um, all the kind of the villagers and burning the bodies. I could say that could be rated R. I mean, I know that, you know, I'm not a parent yet. Um, no, there's not one on the way. But, um, you know, I would say that I wouldn't want my little kid watching Batman v Superman Ultimate Edition rated R and even Batman v Superman PG-13, um, just the, the theatrical cut. I'm not sure if I would want him watching that because it's some there's some very strong themes there and some it's more of an adult superhero movie. Um and that that's actually been a topic of the last couple of weeks because we've had movies such as and you know we've had movies such as Logan and that's more of an adult superhero movie and no I'm not going to say it the dark knight still kicks Logan's ass there I said it um it, it's not, not not nearly as good another story well I've argued that before but I can argue it again anyway um you know Batman v Superman though you know I I think that it it was it was borderline already with PG-13 Making it R didn't make it any better. The violence didn't add anything to it. Um, yeah, sure, you see Ben Affleck in the shower, you see his ass in there. I didn't need to see that. Maybe, you know, the, the um, the boyfriends or girlfriends of the, uh, the viewers of the movie did enjoy that. If that, if that was their thing, that's cool. Um, you know, when you look at movies like Deadpool or Logan, though, that were released from 20th Century Fox, those movies were more, like I said, those are adult superhero movies and they are rated R for a reason because they're more, the, the, the cut, the cursing and the swearing, dropping the F bombs. Um, the, it's bloody. It really is more violence in there. Um, you know, I won't d- divulge into details, but I will say that it's, it's a hell of a lot more than bodies being, or people being shot up. It's way more than that. I mean, it's Wolverine. Think about that. It's Deadpool. He has like samurai swords. What do you think he's doing with those? Take a wild guess. So for Warner Brothers to say a future, rated r you know i did they didn't say batman film let's go back to that they did not say they just said they just said with the right characters so i mean obviously you know as a batman fan do i want to see a rated r batman film honestly i don't need to no i i don't think so and i don't think we really ever will i think the ultimate cut of batman v superman might be the closest that we will ever get there's nothing that I've ever seen in a Batman film that has never needed to be rated R that would add to it. Um, you know, let's look at The Dark Knight, for example. If that movie had been rated R, what would they have made it to be rated R? I mean, okay, The Pencil Trick, that was borderline PG-13 rated R in my mind. Every time I go back and watch that scene, I'm like, oh, did they just show that on screen? I mean, granted, you didn't see any blood, you but you did see a pencil put on the desk. How about a magic trick? It's gone. I'm gonna make this pencil disappear. Ta-da! It's it's gone. You know things like that. I mean, how Nolan was able to do that with a PG-13 movie, I have no idea. But if the Joker was going and just like you know shooting up more people, and it was even bloodier and so forth, and he, they would have showed him carving people's faces, I don't I don't need to see that. I don't think majority of our of the Batman fans want to see that either. Um, you know, if Batman you know, viciously beating somebody or, you know, anything like that. I don't think that, I mean, I don't, I couldn't see Christian Bale's Batman doing that at all. I don't think that would ever happen. And, um, Bane, you know, if Bane was, you know, Bane, they got away with stuff also in the Dark Knight Rises when, you know, Bane would just like break somebody's neck. You heard the sound and you, they cut away just enough time. And I think that's a PG-13 definitely is right where Batman should be. I think that it would be a mistake if they would ever consider making an R. Even movies like Batman the Killing Joke, which was a rated R animated movie. You know, I went back and watched that a couple weeks ago, and I'm like, well, you know, you had a, it may be the violence in there because it's a cartoon, but I don't think it needed to be rated R for, to be, especially for a Batman film. It didn't add anything. It's a pretty good film. Um, you know, Jack Nicholson in Batman 89 with Michael Keaton, that's a dark PG 13 movie. And Batman Returns is even darker than that. I don't know how that's possible, but it is. We won't talk about the Schumacher films, but you know, looking at the Tim Burton films, those didn't need to be rated R. They didn't need to be rated R. And even if they went back and released a rated R cut, I don't think that, you know, like a, a director's cut or something like that, I don't think it would add anything to the movie. Um, you know, with Ben Affleck's Batman, because he is one that, you know, has no problem killing and he's has no problem branding people and so forth. I don't think it's necessary. I really don't. 
All right, so let's look at the statistics for a movie such as Deadpool. So it was a it was a movie that was budgeted at fifty eight million dollars. Okay, now we all knew that you know, and like I said, Deadpool is it's a really great movie. Ba- Batman aside and James Bond aside, it is. If you are a comic book movie fan or just an co- action movie in general, I, I suggest you check that. out. I think it's really good. I'll give credit where credit is due. Now, for a movie that was budgeted at fifty eight million, its domestic box office, and this is per Box Office Mojo, um, it made three hundred sixty three million, and then the domestic box office. That is an amazing, incredibly amount of money for such a small budget. And, you know, it's rated R and, you know, like I said, it's bloody. It's got the language. It's got, you know, it, it's definitely a hard rated R movie. If you look at Batman v Superman, which was released also last year, it, it, it was budgeted at approximately $250 million, yet it only made $330 million. Now, the, I mean, that's if we're talking numbers here. Obviously, the one that wins would definitely be Deadpool because it was such a low budget and it made more money, clearly. Now, if Batman v Superman, for example, was rated R, would that have made it even more money? I honestly don't think so. I really, really don't think so. If they would have released the ultimate cut in theaters, I don't think it would have added anything. So let me put this to rest here. Let me put my final thoughts on this. Um, you know, whatever Warner Brothers decides to do with a rated R character or with its comic book characters that it could be rated R... I don't want to see it happen, Batman. I don't think you'll see it happen to in a Justice League movie. Um, maybe Snyder will release because you know the DCU loves to release the ultimate cut or the extended cut, um, whatever edition, special editions they have uh, lately of their Suicide Squad movie or of Batman v Superman. So one last word about rated R movies and you know the DCU. If they want to do, if Warner Brothers wants to do that, go for it. Honestly, I. It, I don't want to see it. I really don't. I don't think rated R movies. There are certain movies out there that it adds to. And I mean, I, this is apples to oranges, but we'll say movies like, say, a Terminator movie or a Predator movie. I mean, I just like I said, I just saw Logan. And yeah, they did something like that because of the kind of character that um, Wolverine is. Yeah, that probably did make sense to do that. Something for Deadpool did. But when it comes to Batman, honestly, I don't want to see it. I, I honestly, I would probably... It would make me even more nervous if they decide to go in that direction. I think they'd be losing out. And besides, if you're going to try to market a movie, especially one that little kids dress up and collect all the toys, and yes, I consider myself somebody who also collects the toys, the last thing I want to see is a Batman movie that's rated R, because when I do have kids or my nephews, I want to be able to take them and enjoy that and not have to like say, oh, well, oh, you don't, you can't watch this part and so forth. So let me know what you think. Send me a message on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, and let me know what you have to think. Do you want to see a Batman rated R film or not? So moving on to more pressing issues here. And I say more pressing because this is March, baby. That's right. March is here. And as I have been teasing and talking about all over social media for this last week, it has been all about March Madness. Now, no, this is not a sports podcast so if you if you stumbled on this podcast hi this is the batman versus james bond show we talk all about movies nothing having to do with sports however when it comes to march madness something i was trying to do last year that never got off you know was never able to something that i was never able to get to in time because i was still setting up the show at the time was the march Madden, the batman versus james bond show march madness the Batman vs. James Bond show March Madness for 2017 is here. It is going on right as we speak. There have been some incredible, incredible matches that have been going on this last week. Like I said, if you've been following me on social media, it feels like a versus every a couple hours. And that's exactly what it is. Because the answer, we need to know the answer to this. Who is it going to come down to? Is it going to be movies such as The Dark Knight vs. Skyfall? Um, Casino Royale versus uh, Batman 89. I, that's to be determined. I will say this, though, when it comes to the tournament, that all these matches that you're seeing, and there's a total of 32 teams out there, that they were all picked at random. And I made sure I put that on there because I'm trying to be fair when I did this. I'm like, I, I even put it through the random generator a couple times just to say, well... I think this would be fair because, you know, these the, these two movies, I don't want to make sure that they get the boot just yet because you don't want to put all your prime players, you know, you don't want to put the number one and two seed against each other, right? Absolutely not. So, yes, it has been doing it in seeds, and I am pulling it up. This is, if you want to check this out, this is on Ch- 
um, challenge.com slash Batman versus Bond 2017. I'll tweet out the website. But let's look at these matches really quick. Um, Diamonds are the first matchup is Diamonds Are Forever. That was the number one seed versus Batman Begins at number 32. Um, Yeah, this match has already been determined. Actually, all these matches for round one, there will be a total of uh, five rounds. There'll be round two, one, two, three, the semifinals and the finals. Um, you know, this might not even go in. This will probably be about a three week thing. So kind of got a late start, but, um, you know, stay tuned. Like I said, there'll be a match every single day, maybe at least one to two matches now that we're moving on to round two. But the first match was Diamonds Are Forever versus Batman Begins. And if you all know where I stand with this, you know, easily Batman Begins was the clear winner in this. Um, everybody chose in this Batman Begins predominantly 83% to 17 Honestly, if you voted Diamond Star Forever over Batman Begins, shame on you in my opinion because I think Batman Begins is far superior. I want to see that at least make round three. Help me out there, guys, because I'm not doing any voting. Obviously, I can't because I'm kind of just like the, I'm the host in all this. But I want to see Batman Begins do well. Um, we all know that I think Batman Begins is probably my second favorite Batman film out there. It's almost tied with Batman 89. And um, yeah, it's a really great film. So if you haven't checked it out, first check it out. But make sure that you get your voting in. The next matchup was Tomorrow Never Dies versus Batman and Robin. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, Tomorrow Never Dies all the way. Had to go Tomorrow Never Dies on the way. This is and I I didn't vote for this, obviously, but Tomorrow Never Dies came in with 89% to 11% of Batman and Robin. If you voted Batman and Robin, I, I can only imagine what was going on through your mind right now. And I'm not going to criticize you because, you know, as like I always say, all film is subjective, as the great John Campia has always said. Um, and he's the host of Collider Movie Talk. But, y- you know, I, when it comes to that, though, when you say Batman and Robin is better than Tomorrow Never Dies, I'm not saying Tomorrow Never Dies is, you know that much better but i think tomorrow never dies is a decent bond film i mean come on it's pierce and you know the the bmw car chase alone was awesome and you know i think that um oh what was he saying brushing up on a little danish i think that should have put it up at you know at least way higher so you know 89 percent to 11 that's not so bad but tomorrow never dies was the winner with that all right next match was license to kill versus the dark knight oh this this really bugged me because i wanted license to kill to go further in this. And like I said, I, I did put this through the random generator. And when I saw this matchup, I'm like, damn, this sucks because I, I wanted License to Kill to do better. And I know that there was love for License to Kill out there. But unfortunately, when you're coming up against the Dark Knight, which I can say is probably the number one seed out there, at least in the Batman movies, it, it's not going to cut it. It really isn't. So License to Kill put up a fight of 25%. The Dark Knight at 75%. So better luck next year believe me if all goes well with this we will have another one next year and a year from now so moving on here skyfall versus for your eyes only um yeah skyfall came in at 92 percent, and for your eyes only came in at eight you know once again i i do like for your eyes only i really love as a matter of fact for your eyes only i think it's roger moore's second um best bond film i don't think it's nearly as good as skyfall because we all know that i rank skyfall up there as my favorite james bond movie at the present time of recording could change next time i watch casino royale or even honor majesty's secret service but skyfall came in at 92 percent for your eyes only you know really bombed it came in at eight percent there um, the next one was Golden Eye versus The Spy Who Loved Me. Now, these two Bond movies, um, you know, I gotta say, Golden Eye, we all know that I love Golden Eye. I stop what I'm doing. Whenever I tweet this out or I post a picture, everything stops when Golden Eye's on because that's still one of my favorite top five Bond movies. The Spy Who Loved Me is another one of my favorite Bond movies, but the public has spoken. The fans have spoken. Golden Eye won at 78 78- percent to 22 percent 22 percent excuse me for the spy who loved me and i gotta say i was disappointed because i was hoping the spy who loved me would get a little bit more love i think that golden eye is actually you know obviously with the better bond movie and it's one of the more beloved bond movies out there but i was kind of hoping that there would be more of a smidgen of percentage you know there'd be more of a matchup between these two but golden eye proceeds to the next round so the next one is octopussy versus the dark knight rises um once again this one i wasn't I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I think maybe because Dark Knight Rises is still kind of fresh in our mind because it happened in 2012. Um, but, you know, maybe people look past the flaws of the Dark Knight Rises. And, yeah, the Dark Knight Rises has flaws, but I'm still saying it's it's an awesome Batman movie. Octopussy just 
it, it, there's probably no comparison there. And there's not a lot of comparison with these two movies. It's just a question of which one does everybody like better? And I don't think Octopussy, while people, there are fans out there to do enjoy it. I think that there's more people would, can go back and watch The Dark Knight Rises. I think it has, for a movie that's two and a half hours, at least, maybe, was it 240, maybe, give or take? I think I'd rather go back and watch The Dark Knight Rises over and over again as opposed to Octopussy. I mean, even if I have to fast forward to some of the good parts. So there you have it. Dark Knight Rises at 71%. Octopussy at 29%. The next one is The Living Daylights versus The World is Not Enough. I have to say this was one matchup that I would have called the complete opposite because I know, once again, Timothy Dalton has a in, – a quiet following, and I know The Living Daylights is one of those movies that a lot of Bond fans just, you know, they just, it's, if you want to call it a guilty pleasure, if you want to call it whatever, it's one of those Bond movies that people just really enjoy. And The World's Not Enough, I don't, I've never seen, or I've never heard of a lot of people saying, oh, well, it's a good Bond movie, or I think I see a lot more people, or a lot more hate for The World's Not Enough. But somehow, The World Is Not Enough won at 53% to 47%. That was a very, very close match. But believe me, there's ones that get even closer to that. So the world is not enough proceeds to round two. Next one is Goldfinger versus Thunderball. You know, I've said it a dozen times. Goldfinger is also in the top five of my James Bond movies. Thunderball, it's it's good. It's just not up there. Maybe not even the in the top 10 um goldfinger easily edged out thunderball it's definitely lead the battle of the conneries but in this case sean connery and goldfinger came out on top 69 percent to 31 percent and thunderball um the next matchup i was gotta say this one really really surprised me this was another one of those close matchups guys batman v superman dawn of justice just talked about that and we just recently talked about specter and Batman v Superman edged out Spectre at 57% to 43%. Very surprising out there. Maybe it's because it's just a year old or maybe, you know, the people that love Batman v Superman, they, they, they really are. Well, yeah, they really do love that movie. They really do. The diehard fans out there of Zack Snyder, whether you're a Batman fan or Superman fan, they, they can look past the flaws and, in my mind, I will say that I personally think Spectre was the better movie, without a doubt, out of those two. And they both had their flaws, but I think Spectre was definitely had the rewatchability out of that at, uh, over Batman v Superman. So, um, but you know, Spectre is going to have to sit out this round, and it is going to not proceed to round two. That will be Batman v Superman. Uh, moving on here quickly. Batman Forever versus the Man with the Golden Gun. Man, if there was ever a matchup that I didn't know what to call, it was going to be this one. And Batman Forever edged out the Man with the Golden Gun at 51% to 49%. Honestly, I would have, you know, we've been recently talking with That So 90s with Bobby on there um, from the not, That So 90s podcast. And I were talking about Batman Forever. And I said, I think Batman Forever is one of my least favorite Batman movies. I think Batman and Robin is actually better than that and there's fans out there maybe if you're a jim carrey fan i have no idea if you love bat nipples i have no idea but somehow the man with the golden gun ended up winning i mean ended up losing i'm sorry man with the golden gun came in at 49 percent to batman forever 51 percent so we will now be getting a battle of well I'll, I'll pick i'll let you know the round two matchups in just a moment um finishing up with round one Almost there. Quantum of Solace versus A View to a Kill. Quantum of Solace lost to A View to a Kill at 42% to 58%. Um, yeah, there's not many people out there that, you know, th this is one movie that I would say, or one round of movies I would say that not a lot of people love e either, either of these Bond movies, but, um, you know, Quantum of Solace was actually the winner in this 58%. To view to a kill, 42%. Sorry if I said that incorrectly. I'm just making sure I'm checking back over these. 58% Quantum of Solace. Quantum of Solace does advance to the next round. This one is the next one. Oh, this was really, really tight. It was Batman 89 versus Batman Returns. And the winner of this ended up being Batman 89. I was getting worried about this because here I am thinking, I'm like, well, I do love Batman Returns. But I love Batman 89. And the fans spoke 68% to 32%. Sorry, Batman Returns. You're going to have to wait out there in the snow with the penguin until the next year because uh, Batman 89 will advance to the next round. 
The next one was You Only Live Twice versus Dr. No. I'm not surprised here. Dr. No ended up getting 67% to 33% of You Only Live Twice. Um, Honestly, you know, I think that Dr. No, you know, while it might not be like Sean Connery's best Bond movie, you know, the more I think about it, though, there's so many classic moments in that Bond movie. And You Only Live Twice, like I always say. I like two thirds of that. And, you know, I know that, um, people have said, like, uh, Michael Joel's the author of, um, the films of Sam Mendes. He was saying they're really, uh, for a movie that was based on a book, it was, it was nothing like it. And that's what made it, like, not so good. So, and I will, you know, while I've never read the novel, I will say that, you know, looking at the fact that I like maybe a two thirds of, you only live twice, but I could easily go back and watch Dr. No over and over again, as opposed to you only live twice. If I had to pick out of those two, I would say um, Dr. No would win every time. So Dr. No advances to the next round. This next one, this these were the matchups from today. This is the end of the round one matchups. Casino Royale versus Die Another Day. No votes for Die Another Day. None whatsoever. Zero. Zilch. None. Uh, Casino Royale came in. It was the only shutout of all round one. Casino Royale shut out Die Another Day. Um, you know, mic drop for Casino Royale out there. If somebody picked Die Another Day over Casino Royale, I mean, really. Actually, I think there was somebody online that was saying that, you know, Casino Royale is over, you know, it, it they, they don't like it. They were bored with it. And, if as a kid, you know, maybe I would say that. Sure, I don't know, but come on, guys. Apples to oranges. Casino Royale, House Casino Royale for a reason. There's a reason it's one of the best Bond movies ever. So we'll le- let that one be. So Casino Royale advances. Live and Let Die versus From Russia with Love for the next round. Um, this one I I gotta say I'm not too surprised about. It was From Russia with Love. Um, came in at sixty percent to From Russia. Um, to Live and Let Die at forty percent. Um, yet you know, I think easily the From Russia with Love is the second best sean connery james bond movie um it's not full of action but i think it's full of it's a it's a really good story like i said so definitely check that out in the final one here under majesty secret service versus moonraker at 86 to 14 percent um i even said on social media i said um if you vote moonraker i might just have to unfollow you um you know and somebody actually said they should be forced to take a giant step for mankind well whoever decide to vote for moonraker actually it's sorry updated numbers it's 81 to 19 percent but um yeah whoever voted moonraker all over under majesty secret service well to each his own that's cool but i think honor majesty's secret service is definitely going to be the clear winner with that so round two real quick this is what the matchups we're going to be looking at and the biggest thing i can say uh, and i'll repeat this again is when i post these okay i will post the picture on instagram facebook and twitter but the poll the poll is at batman versus bond on twitter that is at batman versus bond you have less the just under 24 hours to cast your vote on there. So if you are a Twitter user, get on there. If you're not a Twitter user, create a profile just so you can vote because your vote counts because I want to make sure we're getting everybody's vote in on this. Um, so we're not getting, so I'm not getting hate mail on this. So then the matchups will be for round two, Batman begins versus tomorrow never dies. That should be good. Uh, the dark Knight versus skyfall. That should be a good one. We have the, we have golden eye versus the dark Knight rises. I think I know who's going to win that one, I'm, but I won't predict. I won't, I'll, I'll say my opinion. Um, the world is not enough versus Goldfinger. Batman v Superman versus Batman Forever. <laughs> oh, wow. That should be really fun. Uh, Quantum of Solace versus Batman 89. Dr. No versus Casino Royale. From Russia with Love versus Honor Majesty Secret Service. So, like I said, make sure that you get your votes in. Batman versus Bond on twitter and um yeah so let's move on here through birthdays we got to go really really quick with this aaron eckhart celebrated birthday on march 12th harvey two-face in the dark night um what can i say about him i think that if it wasn't and i'm not this is not a bad thing and i'm not meaning this in a bad way if it wasn't for heath ledger's joke such amazing performance as the joker in the dark night then you know we would we had an an incredible villain of harvey two-face in there and aaron Eckhart delivered in that and i've said online that i wish we could have seen i mean yeah he was recently in sully but i wish we could see more i thought that was going to be more of his breakout performance in that but every time i go back and watch that i mean yeah his face is cgi'd but 
the acting, the performance they did, seeing such somebody who could be so good, the White Knight, turn into such an, to the to a villain who just you know kind of loses his mind. So I mean, happy birthday to you, sir. So if you haven't checked out The Dark Knight, which is a sin in my mind, definitely go check out The Dark Knight, especially Aaron Hickart's performance as Harvey Two-Face. And meanwhile, while you're watching The Dark Knight, make sure to watch out for this actor. Sir Michael Caine celebrates a birthday on March 14th. Happy birthday, sir. Um, What can I say about Sir Michael Caine? He is, you know, we like I said, we've had different interpretations of Alfred, but his performance as Alfred, it's, it's just, it's perfect. It really is. He's just, he, I don't want, he's like, he's, I don't know. He, he, he played the father figure. He played kind of a grandfather figure at the same time, but I just, it just, you know, for when an actor can make me practically cry in a movie that, I mean, I have to give you the, the most amount of kudos and Michael Caine practically made me cry at the end of the Dark Knight Rises. He still does to this day, but, um, you know, the, his performance throughout the whole Dark Knight trilogy was amazing. So happy birthday, sir. Jai Courtney celebrates a birthday on March 15th. He played Captain Boomerang in Suicide Squad. Um, you know, despite what everybody says about Suicide Squad, I will say that the characters of the movie were most enjoyable. Um, and I really think that, you know, Jai Courtney, he definitely had the, um, the humor elements in there. I think that he kind of, you know, I, every time he was on screen, I wish we could have seen him on there more, but he was always very entertaining. So, so happy birthday, sir. Ludger Pister celebrates a birthday on March 16th. He played Mr. Mandel in Casino Royale. Um, yeah, he was the banker in there. And I always get a kick out of him when he's, he, um, kind of, I don't want to say sneaks up, but he kind of intrudes on Vesper and, um, James Bond as they're getting ready to kiss for the first time. And he's like, hello. And then Bond, Daniel Craig's James Bond says, um, but you didn't bring any chocolate. And he's like, I'm afraid I didn't, or no, I didn't <sighs> like that. And he laughs. Daniel Craig gives like this little chuckle because I think he really, deep down, I think he really was laughing in there. I don't know. I don't think that was improvised in there. Um, you know, so happy birthday, sir, to you, Mr. Mandel. Eunice Gason celebrates a birthday on March 17th. She played Sylvia Trench in Dr. No and from Russia with Love, as you heard in the front clip of the show. And um, what can we say about her? She technically is the first Bond girl, if you really think about it. I mean, I know everybody says Ursula Andros is, but technically she was the first one to <clears throat> with Mr. Bond in um, the beginnings, but right before Bond goes on his mission. What I liked is that they brought her back in from Russia with love and they kind of played on that character a little bit more. Um, you know, whatever happened to Sylvia Trench, you know, she falls in one of those gray areas of, you know, she got to play a Bond girl twice, but, you know, she never, you know, was like the main Bond girl. She never died at the in any of the Bond movies. So, but she always, I, I always loved her personality in that. So, happy birthday, ma'am. And Gabriel Ferzetti celebrates a birthday on March 17th, played Mark Ang Draco in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Mentioned this at the beginning or, or in the middle of the show, saying that, you know, it was the supporting cast is partially what made On Her Majesty's Secret Service so good. I love the character of Draco in there. I really, really, really love him. Um, you know, everything from the very beginning, you know, about, um, oh, how did his quote go? It said, Oh, please do not kill me, Mr. Bond, but if you like, I'll give you a second chance. Little things like that. Um, you know, he played, we, we've never, obviously, James Bond, they never said at that time what happened to James Bond's parents, but I would almost consider him, you know, there's no, technically about it he was the stepfather of james bond once he was married to tracy at the end of the film but even even so throughout the movie he kind of played you know he wasn't just like your typical ally but he did play you know a father figure to james bond he did have an understanding of james bond yeah he was trying to get him to marry his wife or his daughter um that being tracy but i just think that you know he just kind of had that um he was more of a grounded ally and i really did enjoy him in the movie so happy birthday sir so um you know it goes without saying right now there's march madness it's all about march madness right now the batman versus james bond 2017 tournament versus well will be put on hold i know i've been trying to get versus back but there's there's matchups, guys. I mean, there's so many matchups going on. This is nothing but three weeks of nothing but versus back to back to back. So enjoy it. Make sure you vote on Twitter, uh, BatmanVersusBond.com. 
So, that about wraps it up for this episode of the Batman vs. James Bond show. Please subscribe on Spreaker and iTunes, rate it five stars, leave a nice review for me on there. I would very much appreciate it. The biggest thing that I always ask is that you share the show with your friends. That's right. All you have to do is share Batman vs. Bond.com. You know, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and social media at Batman vs. Bond. Find the show on Batman vs. Bond.com and the BS Podcast Network. And also be sure to check out all the other great programming on there, including Science Faction Podcast and Geek Dig Podcast. Like James Bond, I will return. Until next time, I'm Brian Thomas. Thanks for listening and have a great week, everyone. Bye bye. Seating Podcast is part of the BS Podcast Network. Visit bspodcastnetwork.com for more shows just like this one and perhaps a few that are just a little bit better.